Hi, welcome uh, to the third in our fall seminar series uh, for Advanced Transportation Technologies. I'm Max Donath, and uh, I just want to welcome all of you here, uh, both students and professionals. Uh, I just want to remind those students who are registered for the class uh, that the, the students who submitted reports for the first seminar uh, can pick them up uh, from Kylie Bivens uh, after class is over. So they're available. Uh, and uh, a schedule of seminars is available on the side over here, or you can go to the website and pick copies up. I'm going to pass the baton or the microphone here to uh, Kylie, and she's going to fill you in on some housekeeping, especially for those people who are here for the first time or who are signing up uh, off in TV land or internet land uh, uh, today. So, Kylie? Thanks, Max. Um, as always, uh, this, this seminar is also being streamed as a webinar through YouTube Live. Um, and for those of you that are streaming in on the webinar, please know that there is a 30-minute lag. Um, so if you do ask questions at the end, we will um, get to them. We will get to them eventually. Um, for people in the room, please keep in mind that we will um, answer all questions at the end. And for those of you that are streaming, please put all of your questions in the chat box um, on YouTube Live. And also please go on to the same chat box and register. Uh, put your name in there as well as how many people are viewing at your location and your affiliation. Uh, that will help us so we can report that to the USDOT. Um, but otherwise, I will pass it back over to Max. I want to introduce our speaker. Um, you know, the Roadway Safety Institute has a team of collaborators at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign who work on rail safety. And so uh, this uh, semester, I'm very pleased to have uh, Hadi Medani uh, speak to us. I'll just give you a little background uh, on him. Uh, he uh, did his undergraduate and master's degrees at uh, the Sharif uh, University in Iran. Uh, one of my former PhD students is a professor over there. Uh, he's been there for 20 years, so it's been a while. Uh, anyway, um, uh, uh, Professor Medani uh, received his uh, PhD from the University of Southern California uh, in civil engineering, and then did uh, two postdocs. Uh, he did a postdoc at USC. Uh, and also at the uh, Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute at the University of Utah. Uh, and uh, just point out, he also received a master's in electrical engineering along the way, so it's not strictly civil engineering. Anyway, uh, he's uh, very interested in uh, uncertainty quantification, uh, Bayesian statistics, and surrogate-based modeling for civil infrastructure, civil engineering structures, and I'm going to let him tell you all about uh, the work he's doing. Uh, the title's up there, but I'm not going to read it. You can read it just as well as I can. You have a mic. All right. Thank you, uh, Max, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, uh, be here and uh, talk to you about my research on uh, rail track geometry defects. So as Max said, my interests are, in general, uncertainty quantification, so I, uh, the group that um, I direct uh, the uncertainty quantification group. We work on uh, different applications. It's not only the rail track uh, modeling, but uh, today I will, uh, I will focus on this problem, which is the uh, predictive modeling for the growth of track geometry defects. Uh, so this is actually a joint work with uh, Conrad Rupert, uh, who is the uh, associate director for a rail center that uh, we have at uh, UIUC. And uh, uh, Negin is my graduate student who has worked on this problem. I'll begin with the motivation about, uh, about this talk. Uh, track geometry defects actually account for uh, a large number of accidents, rail accidents. Uh, if you rank the, uh, the, uh, the factors that uh, lead to an accident, uh, track geometry ranks number two. So 7.3% uh, of accidents are due to some problems with the track geometry. Top 10% of uh, the accident causes of freight uh, derailments on main tracks are, are 
basically um, listed here. Uh, so as you see, the number two is the track geometry. So there are different factors about the geometry of the track that we should inspect and make sure that they are within thresholds. The three most important ones are these three. So we call the first one the surface defect. So this is really the change in the elevation of the top of the surface for each rail. And uh, the value, the quantity that we use for the surface defect is really measured over a 62 foot cord length. And there are limits for this defect. So that this defect is called surface defect. The second defect is the cross level defect. So this is really the change in the elevation at any point in the straight segment of a track uh, between the top surface of two rails. All right? So we, we only define this defect for the straight segments because, you know, on, on the, on the uh, uh, loops or on tangential curves, uh, uh, you, you do want to have some change in elevation, right, to, to prevent derailment. So this is only the, the defect defined for a straight track. The last uh, the defect type that I'm uh, um, showing here is very similar to this one. It's only measured for the center line of a, tr uh, of a track. So this was uh, basically the measurement for each rail, but this is really the change in elevation for the center line of the track. And this is measured over a moving window of 30 feet. Okay? So these are just the definitions for these defects. Now that we have established these definitions, uh, there are uh, limits or thresholds for these defects. And then depending on those thresholds, railroad uh, uh, companies actually take different maintenance actions. So there are two types of limits or thresholds. Uh, we call it red and yellow. The red tag is really the FRA standards. So this is the federal standards. If any of those defects that you saw uh, exceed these corresponding limits, uh, the railroad are, uh, has uh, to make immediate actions to repair them. All right? So that's FRA, FRA standard. But each uh, railroad uh, has their own standards, right? So they establish a stricter limits, and they call it yellow tag. So these are the defects that exceed a, th a threshold, but they're not that critical according to FRA standards. Okay, but railroad companies may decide to repair these as soon as they exceed these thresholds, right? So we have, in summary, two types of defects, a yellow tag defect and a red tag defect. A yellow tag is the one that exceeds this lower limit, and the red tag is the one that exceeds this higher limit, right? You could think of re red tag as a failure. Okay, so this is a failure. You have to, you have to shut down the track and then uh, fix it, repair the, the, the geometry defect. So the, the tables that I'm showing here for different type or classes of, of tracks, depending on the operational speed for passenger cars and freight cars, you have different limits given for different types of defects that I explained on the previous slide. So for surface, we have these red tag limits. For dip, we have these red tag limits if the track is in different uh, class. All right. All right. So the objective that we have really is, uh, can we get uh, some data from these defects, these geometry defects, and analyze it, and then develop some sort of predictive model for, for the growth of these defects to predict when they'll become red tag or well, when they will become critical. And with that, we can improve the safety by minimizing the probability of derailments and also optimize the maintenance planning. If you know ahead of time that six months later, these, for example, yellow tag defect will turn red, then you can allocate the budget. You don't get surprised 
by this you know, growth of yellow to red tax. Now the questions that we would like to, uh, to address are the following. Uh, the first question is, when will a yellow tag defect turn into a red tag? Can we build a reliable predictive models to predict such uh, transition? And uh, the other one is that uh, better predictive quality, does it lead to improved safety? Does a, uh, uh, a, predictive, a better predictive quality lead us to lower maintenance, co maintenance costs? And what are some you know, computational models that can be useful to, to make these predictive models? So with that, the outline of this presentation are the following. I'll, I'll first describe the problem statement, the data set that uh, uh, we'll work on, and then talk about the survival analysis, which is the methodology that we use to predict these uh, defect growth, and how we uh, estimated the parameters of this model, how we actually use the data to calibrate and validate these models, and then compare it with the available models that uh, is used in practice, and how we can even improve these um, predictive models. So first, the problem statement. So there was a competition two years ago at INFORM's conference. So they uh, provided the teams, uh, the interested teams, with uh, geometry measurements for tracks. And uh, the, the, the data set that um, was provided included red tag and yellow tag. So this was actual measurements from, from uh, rail tracks. So uh, we had these informations given by this data set. So time of inspection, the type of defect, the location of the defect, class and tra track code, the tonnage, operating speed, all this information was given to the participants. The question was that, okay, now that you have all this information as the training data set, there was also a test data set. So they asked the participants to build a predictive model using this training data set and make the predictions based on this test data set uh, which essentially asked for the, the fate of these yellow defects. So they gave us a number of yellow defects, and they, they asked the question, for example, after one month, are they going to turn into a red tag, or are they going to stay as a yellow tag? So that was the, the, the problem that we were supposed to solve. So my student worked on this problem, and we actually won the, the first prize. So I'm actually on, uh, are going to show some of the results from that competition. Now, the problem was that many of these uh, measurements were repeated defect. So basically, uh, since this is actual measurements, tra uh, track geometry cards drive on these tracks. So you need to basically identify repeat uh, or repeated defects. So the defect from the same type uh, within 10 feet uh, uh, on, e on either side of the previous defect uh, was identified as a repeated defect. So the first question that we asked was, can we fit a deterministic model to it? So we had a data set, and uh, the deterministic model was supposed to uh, basically begin at some time t1 with an amplitude for one of these defects. So let's say this is the surface defect. So we wanted to see after uh, some time, so delta t, when, it, uh, when the time is t2, we wanted to see if we can predict a2, the, the future amplitude of this defect. So the input was delta t, and we wanted to predict the increment in the amplitude, the, the increase in the amplitude. So we want to see if we can make this model to be deterministic and get good results. So the linear regression was one candidate for deterministic uh, models. So basically, what we did was to uh, consider some features uh, to be the explanatory variables, so time, initial amplitude, length of the defect, the class of the defect, the tonnage, and so on and so forth. So we wanted to see if we can estimate these coefficients so that we fit a linear model to the data set that we had. And we did that, and we got very poor results. So the R squared was basically 35%, 31%, 29%. So we want these values to be close to 1%. So we figured that uh, deterministic is not the way to go. And uh, the, to visualize that, here's a plot that I'm showing here. So we basically focus on a very particular class of uh, track defects. So this is only the data for dip defect. 
which is the uh, change in elevation of the center line of the track, uh, where uh, this is only the data points that had the initial amplitude within this very short range. And the, this is only the data from class five. Track code was tangent. Tonnage was only within, between five and six. The operation speed was within 65 to 70 mile per hour. So this is really narrowing down uh, the data set to a very particular case, and then you expect the deterministic model to, to, to perform well. But you see this is how scattered the data points are. So the x-axis is the delta t. So after delta t, you want to, you want to be able to uh, predict how much change in amplitude you get. So the data, these blue dots are basically based on the data that you had in the competition, and you see that a deterministic model cannot ever do a good job because there is a scatter. So for a given delta t, you have these delta a all over the place, all right? So the way to go should be a probabilistic approach, right? Because for each delta t, you really have a distribution of, of these delta a's or the model, model response. So we said that, okay, let's do this. Let's, find a, let's fit a probabilistic model to the data point. Now, how are we going to use this probability, uh, probabilistic uh, model? So if, uh, we, or if we manage to get this distribution at different delta t's, then if there is a threshold given by FRA standards or other railroad standards, we can basically calculate the area under this curve, right? So we can say, what is the probability that I exceed this threshold. So this is no longer a zero or one outcome. This is a probability. So there is a, for example, in this case, there is a 40% that I'm below this threshold and 60% that I'm over that threshold. So everything becomes probabilistic. Now the question is, what kind of probabilistic model can we make to explain this data set? So that brings us to the survival analysis. So what is a survival analysis or survival model? So survival analysis has been used to predict the duration of time that a system moves or stays in a function state before it transitions to a failed state. So this has applications in when you want to, when you want to characterize the death in biological or Organ or organisms or the failure of mechanical systems, right? So basically you want, if you have a state here and the failed state, if your system can only be in one of these two states, you want to see after time t what happens. Or in other words, how much time do you need before moving to a failed state? The ingredients in this survival model are the following, so they're all related. So you begin with a failure distribution. So this is the probability of failure, the probability of transitioning from this state to the red state versus time, okay? So this could have different shapes. The first, the first figure could have different shapes. So this particular one tells you that there is a very high likelihood that around time T equal one day, for example, the failure happens, right? So based on the first plot, you get the second plot, which is just the CDF of that. So this is the cumulative distribution. It essentially says that, for example, after one and a half days, for example, there is this probability that a failure has happened. And for example, after two and a half days, 100, with 100% 100 probability, probability one, the failure has happened. Now, if you s subtract this from one, it's as if you flip that, uh, the, 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 the second figure, you'll get the third figure, which is the survival probability. This is nothing independent of the other two figures. It just has this different meaning. So it means that after time uh, t equal one, there is this probability that you've survived. You're still in the function in the state, right? So the whole survival analysis depends on this fi first figure, the failure probability. Once you fix that, you have this uh, cumulative uh, uh, distribution and the survival probability established. Now how do we uh, 
adopt this uh, concept for the prediction of uh, geometry defects. So remember, we had some limits for these defects. So essentially, we had two kinds of states. One was a yellow tag. The other one was a red tag. So we could say that I'm in a yellow tag, and I'm interested in finding the probability that after time t, I am in red tag. Okay? So that's, uh, that's this, uh, the, the, analog the analogy between the standard survival analysis and the track geometry modeling. So want to predict how much time uh, a, uh, a defect stays in a yellow, uh, within yellow tag limits. So the failure probability, the first figure that I showed here, the failure probability that we choose for survival analysis is the Weibull distribution. You could have, you could choose any probability distribution. The reason that we use Weibull distribution is because it's such a flexible probability distribution. So it has two parameters. One is shape and scale parameter. Uh, one is shape and the other one is scale parameters. So this is just to show you how flexible uh, this uh, Weibull distribution is. So I'm fixing lambda, which is the scale parameter, and I'm playing with the first parameter, which is the shape parameter. And you could see that it takes different shapes, the probability distribution, the failure probability, right? So in other words, you could uh, model different kinds of failures using this single Weibull distribution. So this is a kind where probability, you know that probability doesn't happen at the beginning, and as time goes by, there is a certain time interval after which you expect that the failure probability happens. And beyond that, you don't expect. So in other words, you don't expect your system to live for more than two days. So by, by this point, you know that the failure probability should have happened. But the other, the other kinds, is like a, like a decay. So this is like a continuous decay. So the failure probability happens. It's more likely that a failure probability happens at the beginning. And as time goes by, there is a lower chance that that takes place. All right? So in physical systems, typically, we expect to get such behaviors. right? So at the beginning, I mean, you have, depending on where you are, but at the beginning, right after you, for example, are uh, in a yellow tag, uh, you don't uh, expect that immediately after that you, ex you, you transition into a red tag. So typically there is a failure, there is a, like, a, like a service life, right? So around the service life you expect the failure to happen. So there's a concentration of the probability around a given uh, time. All right, so, uh, so this is just a survival model. So once you fix the failure probability to be a uh, variable distribution, the form of the survival model is going to be this exponential function. All right, so it's um, a really flexible distribution. Now, why do we prefer a flexible distribution? Because if you don't know anything about your system, and it's just your data that tells you how your system behaves, then you want to begin with a model that has enough parameters or enough degrees of freedom or enough flexibility that can identify those features from your data. So if I just fix the probability, my probability model to be like this bell shape, and my system actually behaves like this, there's no way that my model can detect this, right? If, I'm, if I fix it to be this, like a Gaussian distribution, okay? But variable distribution is nice because of the, the freedom that it, it offers. Now, the other decision that we need to make is whether uh, we want to develop this model for a very particular class of defects or rather a wider or broader class of defects, all right? So let us say that we stick uh, to the, the surface defect, but that surface defect could be on different track classes, right? So there are track classes based on the the operational speed, depending on how fast the tracks uh, uh, travel on those, tra uh, uh, the trains travel on those tracks. Uh, now you expect, uh, for example, the defects uh, grow 
differently based on the operational speed on different tracks, right? So now the question is, do you want to really build a very specific model for each class? Or do you want to build a universal model that is good for all classes? All right, so there is one option, which, exclusive, which includes exclusive models for each defect with very particular type. The problem with that is that you will have fewer training data sets in general. Because out of the, the whole set of data that you have, it's a small subset that, uh, that corresponds to that particular class. On the other hand, if you develop a global model for all defects, the, the, the advantage is that you have all the data that could be used for that model. But the drawback is that it may not be a very efficient way because you have such a variation in uh, variability in the behaviors of different classes that you cannot capture. So there is a trade-off between going very specific or very general. Now, one way that we thought is, 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 is useful uh, is uh, to basically turn these global models into like parameterize these global models so that they they hold for they can hold for different types of uh, defects. So the idea is to stick with a single global model for all classes, but then incorporate some sort sort of parameterization such that if this is this model is to be used for this class that parameter, there is one parameter in the model that changes. So the model structure itself is fixed. It's just parameterized based on some, some features that, uh, that basically explains different classes of tracks. So now in this form, uh, this was the variable distribution that we had before. Now we chose one of these parameters, the scale parameters, lambda, to be a function of these x, which are the features of each defect. So each defect could have initial different initial amplitude, length, class of track, track code, operating speed, tonnage. And depending on these values, this failure probability could have different scales. Right? We still have the, sh the, the shape parameter p uh, in, in this model. Okay? So we chose. Lambda, which is the, 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 some sort of rate of decay, or this, the, the, the scale of those uh, failure probabilities to be determined based on these features of, of uh, the defects. Now, the, the problem uh, is uh, to find these parameters in these failure probabilities, right? So these failure probabilities should have numerical values for lambda, for p, Right? So now that we have, we're using this parameterization uh, form, we need to find numerical values for beta. Beta essentially says what is the importance of each of these features in determining the, the value for lambda. Okay? So how do we do that? So the next section is parameter estimation. So remember, we had some training data set. We have a very nice, flexible, predictive model, which is variable distribution, uh, which gives us survival model and uh, survival probability and failure probability. Now we want to fit that to our data. Now, what is the, uh, uh, how, how does the, uh, the data look like? So on top, I'm showing uh, what happens in reality. Okay? So in reality, we have, this is your this is the time axis, right? So sometime before here, everything was perfect, right? So there were some minor defects, but because of the uh, train traffic, at this point in time, the defects uh, exceeded this threshold. So at, at this point, they turned yellow. And then they stayed yellow, and then after some time, they turned red. All right, so this is what happened in reality. But we inspired uh, inspected these, uh, uh, this track, this particular location of the track, at a finite number of inspection uh, times, right? So we, I'm showing here that, for example, the inspection could happen at some, you know, delta t after 
the onset of this yellow tag. So it doesn't have to be necess exactly necessarily happen at when they turn yellow. And the next one could happen after delta t and after delta t2. And then the next one which detected this red tag could have happened some days after it actually turned red, right? So our limited observations look like this. So the data sets that we got for the competition look like this. So we have yellow, different yellow measurements and red measurements at different times, all right? So in survival analysis, a data is a pair of uh, observed states uh, and the delta t between them. So this is one data point in survival analysis. So y1 goes to y2 after delta t1. This is another data point, right? So data points are, uh, come in, 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 in pairs. So this is y2 goes from uh, uh, y2 goes to y3 after delta t2, and then the last one is y3 goes to r, to the red tag. Right? We call these first one, first two ones, sensor data. It means that by the end of this of uh, uh, this uh, inspection, so there are two inspections. The last inspection or the second inspection is not a failure, so it's censored, right? So this is just uh, one state that is functioning and the other state that is functioning. This means that it has survived. But the last one is uncensored. It means that you have observed a functioning state and a failed state. All right? So at each uh, point in time, we also have these features. The amplitude, the length, all these things are provided by the data set that we have. All right? Now, the, uh, this delta T1 is exact, this delta T2 is exact, but delta, th uh, delta T3, which is the, the, the time interval between these two inspections, is not necessarily when ye yellow turned into red, right? Because as I said, this could happen somewhere in between. So what we did was to approximate this to be delta T3 divided by two, okay? Just to take the average. All right, so this is the data set that we used to fit our survival model. Now, we had M records, so these are the data points, M pairs. N of M could be uncensored and M minus one of them censored. Now, the likelihood function uh, looks like this. You have N records that are uncensored. It means uh, that they have, uh, there has not been a um, failure, and then there are M minus one that are uh, censored, so they have survived, right? Should be, yeah. Uncensored, they have survived. I think it should be the other way around. But you got the idea. So if it is uncensored, if it is censored, it means that it has not failed. So that, that is correct. So it has not failed, so it, it, it goes to the survival model, so it has survived. And you have N1 that are uncensored, so it has failed, so it goes to the failure probability. So this likelihood function tells you how good your parameter explain your data. So the idea is to maximize this likelihood for different values of these parameters. So uh, we maximize the log of these likelihoods, which is essentially the same as maximizing the, the likelihood. So remember, the parameters that we wanted to estimate was P P and beta, so P and beta is chosen based on this optimization problem. All right, so uh, before getting uh, into the results of the calibration and validation, uh, this is just how we process the data. So there were some issues with the data. Uh, first of all, we considered three, three types of defects, the dip, surface, and uh, cross level. Uh, we considered uh, different, three different models for, the, for those three different kinds. So we replace multiple uh, reports for a defect within a day by their average. So that could happen that within a day there are multiple inspections on a location. And we identify the repeated uh, defects and make them identical. And then identify the maintenance action. So sometimes uh, uh, some of these defects that you have at today, then the next inspection cycle, you see that the amplitude has, 
for example, decreased. So it means that between now and then, there has been some maintenance. So we just remove those data points. We want only to include the records uh, such that uh, there is, I mean, in, in such a way that there is no uh, maintenance action be uh, happen between them. So we basically use the statistical, this is statistical package R to estimate uh, those parameters. So this is how we formed these uh, tables and gave it to R. So these are the results. Now I'm showing this for cross-level defects. Remember this was the survival model, beta and P are the ones that we estimate. So uh, now on this column, the second column, the coefficient column, I'm showing the values for these parameters. So you have a constant which, is, which sits somewhere here. Uh, this uh, length, amplitude, curve, class, operating speed, these are the beta corresponding to each of these features, right? So this really tells you how important is the amplitude on the lambda, which is one of the parameters here. So this is a vector of these features, and these are the corresponding uh, coefficients, right? Now, uh, class 5 is another uh, uh, f uh, factor, and this is its corresponding coefficient. Now, on uh, the last column, the, I'm showing the z-scores. So these z-scores uh, uh, show the statistical significance. So if they are less uh, the absolute values are less than 1.9, it means that they're not statistically significant. So it means that they don't really explain the data, statistically speaking. All right? So we can rule them out. So the only uh, factors or features that were important are amplitude and class. All right? In other words, if you have a defect uh, and uh, you, want to, you want to basically uh, develop a model for different kinds of defect, it really uh, doesn't matter whether this, the operating speed is, what the operating speed for the freight is, what the operating speed for the passenger is, right? It is not important according to the data that we use. It is only the amplitude of the defect and the class of the track that is important, right? And this is 1 over p is just the shape of that distribution, which is obviously important. All right? Now, uh, we have a decision to make, right? So you could basically keep these features to be there. So you could say that um, I want uh, a model that has all these x's and not only these two x's, right? Uh, so that is a decision that you can make. Now I'm going to get uh, to that on the next slide on why is it important to, to, to choose the most simple model that you can get. So basically what we did is to divide the training data set that we had into two subsets. So there is a training subset and then there is a test subset. Right? So the training data, the competition data that we had, uh, we just I think 70% or 80% of that data set, we, we chose it to be training data set, and we kept uh, a small portion of it for our own validation and uh, test results. Okay? So now I, uh, uh, I'm showing these uh, estimated coefficients based on this training data set, and you can see that I have used a reduced model where only uh, two of these features are included in the model. All right. Now, based on these coefficients, we make predictions. So the probability of failure is really 1 minus the survival uh, probability with these known coefficients. You can quantify this. And whenever, after time t, you get this failure probability more than 50%, you say that the yellow tag is now a red tag. So this, these are your predictions. Now, we've, we use this validation data set. And we figured that there is a 71.5% correct prediction using the full model, which is all these, with all these x's. And then there is a 71.1% for the reduced model, which, is, which only has two features. Right? So they're very close. 
all right? But there is a principle in, in predictive modeling and statistical modeling that says that if you have two candidate models with very similar predictive capacity or predictive quality, which is the case here, right? You should always go with the one that is simpler, all right? So this is just, a, a, this is called a, the, the Occam's razor uh, principle. And the reason is that if there are, if it's a more complicated model, then it's, it's more likely that you miss the, uh, the, the right features of the model, right? Because we're, we're dealing with limited data, and uh, for future predictions, it's better to stick to the reduced model. So that's what we did. So for the competition, even though we observed that the full model, uh, the full model gave us similar predictions, based on the, uh, we, we made the predictions based on the reduced model because it's a simpler model, all right? So this was only the validation results for the cross level and then these are the, the other validation results for the surface defects and deep defects. So 75% correct prediction and 73% correct prediction, all right? So these are the, uh, the, the validation results. Now, so we basically made the predictions for the data sets and we, we won the competition, uh, by the way. So I think on the, on the test data set we had uh, more than 80% correct prediction. Um, so I'll move on to two more topics uh, and they're, they're not gonna take too, too, too much time. So we want to see um, uh, how this model actually compares with the way that uh, the prediction can happen or can, uh, can be performed in, in practice today, and then how we can even further improve the survival model. So the first uh, item uh, is uh, the segment-based prediction. So in, in rail industry, uh, so when you detect a, a, a defect, to be a red tag or yellow tag. In other words, if the railroad company decides to repair a defect, they do the repairs over a segment of the track. So it's not like very local. It's not like over a stretch of, I don't know, a few feet, you go ahead and fix this cross level or uh, the elevation, the, the longitudinal elevation. You, the, the, the cars and the devices that are used for this correction and repairs are such that it performs these actions over a segment of a track, right? And these segments are typically half a mile, all right? So it's a, it's a very long segment, okay? So that is why in practice people really, if you want to make predictions or assessment of how good a track is, they deal with segment-based indices. So they just say, okay, how good is this segment and how good is the next segment? They don't care about individual locations. So that's how this is done in practice. Now we want to say, okay, if that is the case, if we want to make predictions for a given segment and not a specific location, uh, how can we do that using survival model? Okay, so the quantity of interest now here is the probability of having at least one red tag in a given segment, all right? not in a specific location. So previously we were talking about a specific location. Here is now over a segment. So as I said, the status quo is that you have some track quality index, which is like an overall uh, formula for a segment of the track. And based on that, you make a decision whether or not to fix the, the track. So this is what we call the course scale model. And we want to now make a comparison between that using our fine scale model, which essentially goes and investigate the individual defects that live within a segment and make a predictions based on individual defects within, within the segment. So I'm, on this slide, I'm comparing the fine scale with the coarse scale survival model. So in other words, I build a survival model for a segment without caring about individual uh, defects, their amplitudes, their, their past, their history. I just look at the course level index 
that the industry uses. All right. Alternatively, what I do, uh, which is uh, called the fine scale, is to basically identify the defects within a segment and then build individual survival models for each and make predictions based on that. And as you can see here, what I'm showing is a comparison between the percentage of correct predictions for the fine scale model and the coarse scale model. The x-axis is the segment length, right? So for example here, for a segment length of 0.2 miles, you see that if I just use the, the, this industrial in the standard, I'll get 70% correct prediction. But if I use the fine scale segment base, but by, by including the fine scale information about the defects, I can push that up to 75%. So in terms of the prediction quality, overall uh, percentage of correct predictions, I'm doing better than the course scale, and it doesn't matter what the segment length is, right? So for any choice of segment length, I'm doing better than the course scale. Now let's break this down a little bit. Uh, so this was just the number of the percentage of correct predictions. Now you could have different uh, scenarios, right? Your correct predictions could be the correct failure prediction or the correct survival prediction, right? So now I'm comparing the fine scale with the coarse scale. So you see that here, the fine scale, I had 66% correct failure prediction. This guy had 76%, so this was better. Uh, but the correct survival prediction was I did better. I mean, we did, the fine scale model did better, 76% over 59%. All right? But the, the, the important uh, numbers that, uh, that matter when you care about the safety of, of these railroads is the wrong failure, uh, the wrong survival prediction, right? So this is uh, like a false negative. So you, basically you predict after, for example, one month, this defect is going to be as within the safety limits. And as a matter of fact, it is not going to be the case. So that is a false negative. And these false negatives are going to result in derailment because you don't catch them in time, right? So you see that the survival, the wrong survival prediction, we are doing much better compared to the course scale model. So 41% of the predictions are wrong survival prediction, and here, 24th percent of them is wrong survival prediction. And you may not feel comfortable about these numbers because it's 24 percent is still a large value. But uh, remember, these are statistical models. I'm not using any other kinds of physical laws or, or any, 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 any other first principles. It's just based on the data. And the data is there is noise involved. So remember, these are statistical models. There is always the, some probability of missing uh, or not exactly predicting the right, uh, the right uh, outcome. But uh, if you compare it, this is the best that you can do, right? Now, this, uh, if you want to, again, compare the fine scale with coarse scale, another uh, aspect is the maintenance cost. So are we, do, are we going to do better in terms of the maintenance uh, cost if I use a fine scale? And what I'm showing here is a, is a plot that shows the cost saving if I move from a coarse scale to a fine scale prediction model. And you see that there is an average of 14, 13, 12, percent cost saving if I make that switch. So this is significant because the maintenance costs are typically very high. All right. So there is this benefit, additional value if I uh, include the fine scale information. Now the other one is just a more detailed model. So I showed you a two-state survival model when there is a one yellow and one red. 
you may ask yourself, can we make it more detailed? So break down the yellow tag limit, uh, the yellow tag state into two states with different limits. This is a more detailed model. It's a higher resolution model. And it is expected that you perform better. So we did that. So essentially, if you have two states, there is one transition uh, between the two states. But now that you have three states, there are three transitions, right? You could go directly from Y1 to R, or you could go to Y1 to Y2, and then to R. So you get a transition matrix like this, and we need to quantify these probabilities. So they can be quantified based on the survival model according to this integral. And we did that for this data set for the cross-level defect. And once we did that, we saw that there is an improvement by 3%. So it wasn't a significant improvement over a two-state survival model. Um, so this is a small improvement, maybe due to insufficient data, because we didn't have a very rich data set. Um, but the recommendation is that if, data, if you have enough data, uh, the detailed model that I showed on the previous slide, the three-state model over the two-state model, is guaranteed to work better or at least equally well in terms of the predictions. All right, so this is the conclusion. Uh, we basically may try to make the, ca make the case that deterministic models fail to capture complex defect growth, and then the flexible uh, probabilistic models uh, can be used. And if they're parameterized, they can uh, explain a broader class of defects. We basically use the validation results to show that the survival model outperform the coarse scale um, index-based model that is, that is used in practice today. Uh, we also demonstrated that the spatial resolution of the training data, which are the individual uh, defect information, if those are used, uh, then we can improve the predictive capacity. And also, we kind of somehow showed that the model resolution or the number of states can also have an impact on the prediction. So these are the ongoing efforts that we are uh, currently taking. We are trying to work with big, big data. So this data set that we had was rather limited. So we are working with the data from Amtrak and Norfolk Southern so that it has a richer data set. Uh, Based on that, we can reach uh, more conclusive results based on, I mean, regarding the optimal uh, resolution for your model. Uh, we, uh, the other objective that we have is to determine the optimal inspection policy. Is there an optimal inspection period that minimizes the overall cost? I mean, do you have to do the inspection every month, every day, every year? Uh, how do you decide on that? Uh, and the last one is to just quantify the implication on safety. Because currently, we don't know if there is a, f f uh, a uh, probabilistically or quantitatively, we don't know uh, what is the impact of defects, geometry defects, on derailments and other safety issues. We don't have any quantitative measure. So we want to establish that relationship as well. All right. So I would like to just acknowledge the, uh, the support that we received from this AAR uh, technical outreach program, which supported this work. Thank you very much for your attention. And I would be happy to, to take any questions if you have some. Remember, you need to use, you need to use the microphone uh, for questions. Uh, do we have any? I've got about 30 minutes of questions. All right, sounds good. <laughs> So we'll be squeeze them in. Um, can we go back to the very first slide where you had a list of 10 causal factors related to crashes in the rail industry? Uh, there. Okay. Yeah. All right. So if we take a look at these, these are all infrastructure related, from what I can tell. Um, yes. Mostly related to the track. Yeah. But I see several bearing failures, broken wheels. So some of it is vehicle related. Yeah. 
but I don't see anything related to the train operator, train operator fatigue. Uh, human error. Right, huh? Human error. Uh, then there's the effect of a, a rail crossing where there's a vehicle in the way. Uh, that's another you know, factor. So this if I add up the percentages, does that add up to 100%? I don't think so, no. No, I don't think so no. either. So Yeah, so there are. So this is, these are just the top of 10. All, of all rail failure, rail crashes? Let's these are not crashes. These are all derailments. Derailments, yeah. I understand. So what percent of the problem is derailment as opposed to oh. uh, a, via a rail crossing crash or an operator fatigue crash? That, that figure, I, I don't know. But I know derailment is, is a good portion of overall. It is know, a good yeah. portion. Yeah. Accidents, you mean, right? I right, mean, of course. Any, any accident All right. related so to traffic. So my next question is, how do they collect this data? The, the geometry? Yes. So there are track geometry cars. Yes. So these are, I mean, there are, there are state of the art, yeah. like laser measurements that are, I mean, my, my colleagues are working on, but the, the standard, uh, uh, the standard way that it is typically done in practice is a track geometry car. So this is just a single car that travels on these tracks and measure the, the, the elevation. So it's like a signal of like t time history of the elevations and that signal is processed and these defects are identified. So this data measurement car is added to a train. So at the end mm -hmm. of the train, there's this geometry measurement car. Mm -hmm. That I don't know. I'm not sure if it's just a single car with some locomotive or they're just it's behind a, a car. But I know that they frequently f travel over the tracks and, and detect it. I don't know about the details, what's mm -hmm. the technology, uh, but I know that uh, they start to, to look at how they can make these measurements by vision vision-based inspection, so that there's just, they're just cameras that detect these uh, geometry defects and not the, you know, the oscillation, the vertical oscillations of something. Anyone have any questions? The, so what does the industry use now for predicting, you know, red tag, yellow tag? How are they doing it before you came along? They don't do it. They don't? They don't? How do they decide when to repair the track? They don't have any, they don't have any forecast model. They don't know ahead of time when these things So they wait for happen. a derailment? No, no, there are. So it's just, like, so these data is only used to tell them when to shut down the track. So for example, they, they make these measurements. If it's yellow, then they may decide to, to repair it. But when it becomes, the, the red tag, then they immediately shut down mm -hmm. the system. It's, the data is not processed. It is just uh, like a health go no, monitoring. Go, no, go. Yeah, it's just a monitoring thing. OK, well, I, I have uh, quite a few more, but we're running out of time. Any questions from uh, in, off the internet? OK. Well, why don't you just uh, join me in thanking our speaker. Interesting. <laughs> And just very quickly, want to remind you, next week uh, we have also a speaker from uh, outside the state. Uh, we're going to have uh, Donna Ray Sapp, who's a senior policy analyst with the uh, Indiana University Public Policy Institute. And she'll be talking about analyzing Indiana crash data to inform traffic safety policy and program development. And I believe she's in charge of the crash database co data collection uh, for uh, predicting and analyzing uh, causal effects and the like uh, in Indiana. And uh, we, by the way, I'd just like to let you know that uh, University of Minnesota developed uh, the crash database collection system uh, for all law enforcement agencies uh, here in the state of Minnesota. So anyway, next week, same time, same place, tune in. Thank you. Thank you again.